All right, let's dive in. We're going deep this time uh, with uh, musical legend Neil Diamond. Ooh, yeah, classic. We got a stack of your requests, and this book, Neil Diamond's Songs of Life by Alexander Gresbeck, seems like the perfect way to do it. Get ready for Sweet Caroline like you've never heard it before. We're going way beyond just the hits, really unpacking the stories and emotions behind some of his most iconic tracks. So to kick things off, Grisbeck really emphasizes this recurring theme of isolation that pops up in a lot of Diamond's work. Yeah, there's this fascinating tension, you know, this back and forth between solitude and this yearning for connection, love, belonging. You really feel it in the music. Yeah, and it's not just theoretical. It's right there from the beginning. Solitary man. Such a raw song. And it turns out incredibly personal for Diamond. He didn't even reveal how personal it was for him until much later in his career. But knowing that backstory, it changes how you hear it. It's not just about being alone. It's like that ape for something more. Totally. Searching and not quite finding it. It makes you listen to those lyrics with a whole new ear, right? You're suddenly hearing it for the first time. So we've got isolation, but then Gresbeck digs into something a little unexpected. Spiritual exploration in Diamond's music. Yeah, and it's not always overt religious themes either. More this like uh, yearning for something bigger than yourself, you know, a search for meaning, connection beyond the everyday. Holly Holy is a great example. It's got this almost meditative quality, a sense of transcendence. You'd think it's a straightforward religious song. Right, but it's more complex than that. Diamond himself actually said it's not about a deity, but about the spiritual connection between people, like finding the sacred in human relationships. Wow, that's beautiful. And then there's Brother Love's Traveling Salvation show. Gresbeck talks about how it was inspired by a real revival meeting that Diamond went to. He even talked about the experience on the Johnny Cash show. Can you imagine? He described himself as like, this cocky college kid, you know, going to the revival meeting, thinking he had it all figured out. But the music, the preacher's raw emotion, the people seeking solace, it really shook him. Yeah, like book smarts weren't everything. Totally. He was humbled. And you can hear that that searching, that questioning in so much of his music. Okay, before we get too existential, let's rewind a bit back to Diamond's early career. We can't talk about that without mentioning the Brill Building, the heart of the music scene back in the 60s. What a phenomenon. And Diamond was right in the middle of it, mentored by Jeff Berry and Ellie Greenwich, a power couple who practically defined the sound of an era. Imagine that. Talk about an education. Yeah. And their influence is all over Cherry Cherry. That energy, those hand claps, it's pure Brill Building magic. And here's a fun fact from the book. Mm -hmm. That sound almost didn't happen. They actually used the demo version because they couldn't recreate that raw energy in the studio. Sometimes you just can't beat those spontaneous moments. Right. Maybe you should wonder how many other hits were born out of happy accidents. All right, let's shift gears a bit and talk about another theme that runs through a lot of Diamond's work. Nostalgia. He's looking back, reflecting on childhood, family, you know, those experiences that shape who we become. Brooklyn Rhodes. Perfect example. You can smell the street food, hear the kids playing. You're right there walking those streets with them. Yeah, but nostalgia isn't always bittersweet. It can be pure joy, too, like honey dripping times. Exactly. It's pure, unadulterated joy of childhood, like life was simple and sweet. And that contrast between Brooklyn Roads and honey dripping times really shows how much range Diamond had as a songwriter. Right. Longing and loss, but also those moments of pure bliss. Speaking of looking back, Cold Water Morning is another one that comes to mind. Does Gresbeck touch on that? He does. It's a good contrast, too, to the bright nostalgia of Honey Drippin' Times. It's more melancholy, hints at a lost love, longing for something that's gone. Cold Water Morning. Right. It's like that chill in the air is representing the emptiness. Yeah, a real sense of isolation. But there's also a glimmer of hope, right? The dawn of a new day, the chance to start fresh. Exactly. Even in the sad songs, he weaves in some optimism. Like a reminder that even when things are tough, we can keep going. Which is what makes his music so relatable, I think. It's honest, but it's also hopeful. Mm -hmm. But it's not all deep thoughts and introspection. Diamond could let loose and have some fun, too. Porcupine pie. Anyone. Oh, how could we forget? Don't let it get on your jeans. Ah. So quirky. And the fact that he included it on Hot August Night, one of his most iconic live albums, shows he didn't take himself too seriously. It's like a wink to the audience. Hey, I'm just having fun up here. Exactly. And speaking of fun songs, Cracklin' Rosie. 
Who knew a song about lonely guys and cheap wine could be so catchy, right? Grisbeck talks about how it was actually inspired by a folktale about a Native American tribe in northern Canada with a shortage of women. Wait, what? Yeah, so the men who didn't have dates on Saturday night would console themselves with a bottle of crackling rosé. That's amazing. The things you learn. Right, shows you inspiration can come from anywhere. A good story, even a quirky one, can resonate with people all over the world. And resonate it did. His first American number one hit and his bigots in the UK. Talk about a breakthrough moment. So, Gresbeck doesn't just focus on the obvious hits. He digs into some of Diamond's more complex songs too, the ones where the meaning isn't always so clear cut. He even encourages readers to like, look for hidden meanings. Double entendres. He actually uses the term double entendre and mm -hmm. even takes a moment to define it for the reader, which is great. It's that playful use of language where a phrase can have two meanings, often one that's a bit risque, suggestive. So it's a lyrical puzzle. And we get to put on our detective hats and try to decipher those hidden messages. Totally. Gresbeck gives clues and context, but he leaves room for interpretation, too. Like, he invites you to bring your own experiences and perspectives to the music. And I think that's what makes great art so powerful. It sparks conversation, gets you thinking critically. So it's not about finding the right answer. No, it's about the journey, engaging with the lyrics and the music on a deeper level. And sometimes realizing there might not be one right answer is part of the fun. So, for example, Longfellow's Serenade. There's been a lot of debate about whether there are double entendres in those lyrics. And Gresbeck encourages you to explore that. He points out these subtle hints, like the way Diamond sings certain phrases, even delves into his personal life to see if there are connections. It's like a musical treasure hunt. Desiree is another one that sparks a lot of discussion. Is it a straightforward love song or something more? Gresbeck dives into that one too, pointing out that the lyrics are, well, pretty suggestive. He even quotes a fan who remembers Diamond introducing Desiree as, I became a man at the hands of a wise old sage during a concert. Whoa, now that's an interesting image. Right. Adds a whole new layer of intrigue. Makes you wonder if there's a personal story behind those lyrics. Something Diamond might not have explicitly said, but hinted at through his music. It's like we're getting a glimpse into his mind, his experiences, filtered through his art. But then you have songs like Holly Holy, which Diamond described as stream of consciousness writing. So are we overthinking it when we try to find those concrete meanings? That's a great question. And I think Gresbeck acknowledges that different songs lend themselves to different kinds of analysis. With Holly Holy, it's more about the feeling, the atmosphere, than a literal story. So the beauty is in the sound and the emotion it evokes rather than dissecting every word. Exactly. But even with a song like that, we can still look for recurring themes, those musical motifs, lyrical patterns that give us insight into Diamond's creative process. Okay, so we've talked about isolation, spirituality, nostalgia, even a touch of lyrical mystery. But we can't wrap up this deep dive without addressing the elephant in the room, or should I say, the song in the stadium, Sweet Carolyn. Oh yeah, the song that's practically become synonymous with Fenway Park. That sing-along is pure joy. But it wasn't originally intended as a baseball anthem at all, was it? Nope. Respick tells us the inspiration came from a photo of a young Caroline Kennedy. Wow. A photo of a young Caroline Kennedy sparked one of the most iconic sports anthems. It's wild how a song can take on a life of its own become something completely different from what the artist intended. And in this case, it's become a cultural phenomenon, a symbol of shared experience. It shows you the power of music to connect with people in ways you'd never expect. Exactly. And that's just one example of how Neil Diamond's music has woven its way into our lives. And we'll dive into more of those stories and connections in the next part of our deep dive. All right, welcome back to our Neil Diamond deep dive. Still plenty more to uncover. Yeah, we've hit some of the big ones, but I'm really curious to dive into the albums themselves. Grisbeck does a great job of walking us through Diamond's discography, those key moments and themes. It's like you're peeking behind the curtain, right? Okay. You see his style evolve, how he played with different sounds, genres, and just the sheer amount of heart he poured into each one. And it's interesting to see how the critics reacted over time, too. Early stuff, lots of praise for that raw energy, emotional honesty. Yeah. But then you hit the 80s, and some critics thought his music got a bit too polished. Yeah, almost like he was walking this tightrope between staying true to his roots and keeping up with what was happening in the music industry. It's true. An artist's career is never just a straight line to the top. Peaks and valleys, moments of reinvention, detours that lead to unexpected discoveries. I'm thinking about Headed for the Future. Graysbeck mentions it didn't quite live up to its title. 
Was Diane maybe struggling to find his place in a changing musical landscape? Think about it, mid-80s. You've got synth pop everywhere, new wave artists pushing boundaries. Where does a guy like Neil Diamond with his blend of pop, rock, folk, fit in it was a transitional time for a lot of artists it makes those lyrics from the best years of our lives on that album even more interesting on the surface it's all empowerment positive change but there are lines like wish i could tell you everything was all right like maybe some uncertainty creeping in yeah maybe even when he was putting on a brave face there was that vulnerability underneath grappling with his place in a music world that was changing fast and that vulnerability is something you see a lot with artists who achieve that level of success. The pressure to keep delivering, stay relevant, it's gotta be tough. Oh, for sure. That tension between artistic integrity and commercial success, it's something Diamond wrestled with his whole career. Sometimes he nailed it, sometimes not, but he never stopped creating. That's what's so admirable. Never gave up, kept experimenting, pushing himself, even when the critics weren't always kind. And sometimes those experiments paid off big time. Speaking of heartbreak, I'm curious about how Diamond's personal life played into his music. Gresbeck doesn't shy away from the tougher parts of his story, particularly his three marriages. Home is a wounded heart. Brutal, isn't it? Guilt, regret, the sacrifices he made for his career, the impact on his family. The only trouble is, Jimmy, we never seem to get it right. Oof. It's a good reminder that even the most successful people struggle with work-life balance. Pursuing your dreams versus nurturing relationships. It's something so many people can relate to. Absolutely. A universal theme. And Diamond doesn't sugarcoat it. He lays it all out there. The good, the bad, the messy. He went through a very public, very expensive divorce from his second wife, Marcia Murphy. Like he's working through it all in the music, trying to make sense of the pain, the loss. And it's interesting, he doesn't shy away from the anger either, not trying to present this perfect image. It's that honesty, that willingness to be vulnerable, that makes his music so compelling. You're getting a real glimpse into his soul. Gresbeck mentions Diamond even went to therapy to deal with the guilt he felt over not being present enough for his kids because of his career. Pretty brave. It is, and a powerful message, too. It's okay to ask for help. Yeah, to acknowledge your weaknesses, work on becoming better, it's a good reminder that even legends are human. Right. They make mistakes, have regrets, experience pain, and sometimes that's where the best art comes from. But let's switch gears a bit. What about Diamond's stage presence? He was famous for those extravagant costumes, all the sequins, the whole showman persona. It's funny because one of his biggest hits is Forever in Blue Jeans, but you rarely saw him in denim on stage. Like this song was this ideal of simplicity, but his stage presence was all about embracing the spectacle. So why the contrast? What was the thinking there? I think it was about creating an experience, you know? <laughs> Transporting the audience, the costumes, the lights, the choreography. It all enhanced the music, made it unforgettable. And it worked. People went to his concerts, not just to hear the music, but to see the show, be swept up in that energy. And you know what's really cool? He kept every single costume from every tour. Seriously? Yeah. Wow, that's dedication to his craft. Like a museum of Neil Diamond on stage. It's like those costumes were part of the music, another way to express the emotions, the stories he was telling. Speaking of connecting with fans, we got to talk about America. Oh, yeah. A song that's been embraced by everyone. Immigrants, politicians, athletes. It's become a symbol of that American dream, the idea that anything's possible. And it's still so relevant today. A reminder of those ideals that drew so many people to this country. And Diamond's own immigrant background makes it even more powerful. He wasn't just singing about the American dream. He was living it. Absolutely. He understood the struggles, the triumphs, and it comes through in the music. But Gresbeck also points out that America has been used in ways that maybe Diamond didn't intend. Yeah, it's been adopted as a political anthem, sometimes by people whose views don't really align with that message of inclusivity, unity. It shows you how art can be interpreted in different ways and how meaning can change over time. But it also speaks to the power of Diamond's songwriting. Right. It sparked these conversations about national identity, immigration, what it means to be American. That's the beauty of great art. It challenges us, makes us think, pushes us to have meaningful conversations. We've covered a lot, but we barely scratched the surface of Neil Diamond's incredible career. There's so much more to explore. Back again for the final part of our Neil Diamond deep dive. What a journey it's been. From those early Brill Building days to those sold-out stadiums, incredible career.
What really stands out to me is how he never stopped evolving as an artist, mm -hmm. experimenting with genres, different collaborations, always pushing his sound forward. Like that whole thing with Rick Rubin later on. Talk about a shakeup. Brilliant pairing, really. Rubin, known for that stripped down production style, <laughs> he helped Diamond get back to that raw songwriting power. Albums like 12 Songs, Home Before Dark. They just felt so intimate, honest. Yeah, I was like peeling back all those layers and getting to the heart of what made his music so special. Those lyrics, his voice, those melodies. Yeah. Timeless. Grisbeck calls 12 songs a return to form, and it's easy to see why. You can listen to it again and again and always find something new. And it's on this album that we get, Hell Yeah, which is, wow, one of his most profound songs. Acceptance, facing the end of life with grace, and even humor. Pretty that powerful stuff. Yeah, like you were saying, I've lived a full life, seen it all, and I'm ready for whatever comes next. There's a real sense of peace in that song. And it feels like a fitting way to end our Neil Diamond exploration. We've covered so much ground. His themes, the hits, the albums, his personal life, that stage presence. What a ride. It has been. So what have we learned? What are the big takeaways from our Neil Diamond deep dive? I think the biggest one is that Diamond's music, it's more than just catchy tunes. It's a reflection of life, you know, uh, with all its complexities and contradictions. Yeah, it's about that isolation and connection, spirituality and doubt, the pull of the past, but also searching for meaning in the present. It's love, loss, the power of music to heal and bring people together. And a reminder that even legends are human. They make mistakes, they struggle, they grow. And those journeys can inspire all of us. Neil Diamond's music is a gift. It's a soundtrack to our lives, a reminder that we're not alone in our joys and sorrows. So next time you hear a Neil Diamond song, really listen. You might be surprised by what you discover. And for an even deeper dive, definitely check out Alexander Gresbeck's Neil Diamond Songs of Life. It's packed with insights and stories that will give you a whole new appreciation for his music. And that's it for our deep dive into the world of Neil Diamond. We hope you enjoyed it. Until next time, keep exploring, keep learning, and keep diving into the things that fascinate you. See you next time.